Good evening and welcome. My name is Liran Brummel. This is NCN News Extended. Tonight we're chatting with Parliamentary Affairs Minister and Minister of Governance, uh, Ms. Ms. Gail Teixeira. Parliament opened earlier today. The first sitting of the 12th Parliament happening at the Artichon Conference Centre. Because we're operating under COVID guidelines, the Parliament building, which, not, which normally hosts the sittings, uh, does not have the required space to involve, to, to have everyone involved in the sitting. So, by proclamation of President Dr. Mohamed Irfan Ali last week, all sittings of the Parliament will now be held there until such time that we are clear to move back to the Parliament Buildings. Minister, thank you very much for joining us this evening. How are you? Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and good night to all your viewers and thank you for having me. It's an interesting day. It's a very long day. Exactly one month in government, Parliament convenes the 12th uh, Parliament, the first sitting. How would you describe today's uh, proceedings in the Parliament? Well, first of all, it was a very symbolic day because um, it is the beginning of the Amerindian Heritage Month. And so September 1st uh, signals that. And as you saw, it was significant too because it's the first time that an Amerindian has become the deputy speaker. So I thought that was an extraordinarily uh, important um, issue to be recognized by the media and by Guyanese that we've never had a deputy speaker who is Amerindian. And what a better time to do it than on the first day of Amerindian Heritage Month. And of course, as you said, this is one month since the swearing in of President Ali after a very, very long, long and torturous wait of over five months for the declaration of the results. And so today is, uh, we keep moving forward as a government. We have taken the reins of government and we are moving every single day and uh, we're running on a very fast pace on, on trying to get the country back into order and to be able to uh, move swiftly through the transition. So today was one more step in the transition of a new government by having the parliament meet, uh, convene and to be able to have the first sitting and to have all the members of parliament sworn in and to elect the speaker and the deputy speaker. And we had a number of matters on the agenda which are also important. And I think the public needs to know about those as well. Interesting. Even as we talk about having the deputy speaker in, in, in Mr. Lennox Schumann, uh, Mr. Manzun Adair yes. is also now the speaker of the National yes. Assembly. So those were the, the first two uh, uh, pieces of business uh, for the House. And then, of course, all MPs were also sworn in. Yes. Talk about that. You've also had the constitutional um, bodies present their budgets and have it approved, yes. $11.2 billion as well for the spending. Yes, we have the, 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 the discussion about the emergency budget that is going to be presented. This, is, this represents the first step going forward. Yes, the, it's, when the 2015 amendment was made by the APNU government, it was to separate the constitutional bodies to allow their budgets to go forward. And this is the first time in six years that since that amendment that the constitutional bodies proposals or requests for money uh, was not cut. As you may remember in 2016, right through, the budgets have been cut by the Minister of Finance and certain agencies quite drastically, in, in particular those that are such as the Auditor General's office and the DPP's office that are critical. And so in this case, uh, all the constitutional bodies presented their, their requests for 2020, and in particular, what you call October to December, where we're looking at, uh, uh, with COVID, how we can manage to, to uh, to implement many of the programs and policies of these bodies. So um, we were able to, because there was no contention, unlike in the past, because the act makes it clear that you can't question the line items or the heads of any of the constitutional bodies. You can only question the Minister of Finance in regards to any amendments or uh, he may have made to the request by the constitutional bodies. In this case, there were none we had reviewed the constitutional bodies proposed budgets and we accepted them and recommended that they be approved as is 
And so I think that's an important development as well, um, that this is the first time that has happened since that amendment was made in uh, 2015. We also had, uh, Lee, two other matters that may sound rather procedural, but they are important. Because of the five month delay in getting the declaration of results, when President Ali was sworn in, it was August the 1st, and that um, the recess of Parliament starts August the 10th to October the 10th. Now, of course, there hasn't been a sitting since May the 23rd, 2019. And so it was critical that we had to bring a motion to one, allow us uh, to meet during what is uh, called the recess period of Parliament, so we could get urgent parliamentary matters on the, the floor of the House, as well as bring the uh, budget for 2020, the estimates and, and revenue, etc., for 2020, where we have been operating without a budget now for, what is it, uh, eight months. And so it's important, those were two important issues that were dealt with. The third issue had to do with the hours of Parliament and we had to amend the standing orders to allow for that. And that is that um, normally Parliament, as you know, meets from 2 to 10 o'clock at night, for example. We have uh, changed the hours to start from 10 o'clock in the morning with uh, breaks in between and going as late as 8 o'clock at night. So we haven't done that today, of course. We didn't go that late, but I am sure when we start the budget debate, that we will be going until eight o'clock at night. So that those motions were all approved by the National Assembly. What it means too, although COVID is on from six to six, the curfew that members of parliament will get special passes in case we go as late as eight o'clock uh, to be able to be on the road at that time. So I think those were important innovations. I just want to add, Lee, that the arrangements that the clerk and the staff of the parliamentary office put in order to try to protect us um, and to safeguard uh, everyone there in regards to COVID-19 was and the support of the police and the Ministry of Health, etc., were all very well implemented and executed. And, and I want to thank them for the time and attention it took to, to do all of that, because it took a lot of learning of how can we keep ourselves um, safely distant and also COVID free. Of course, you know that there was uh, something that happened in Parliament where the clerk had sent out the day before an advisory to all MPs basically saying, if you are COVID positive, could you please desist from coming to Parliament? Regrettably, we learned in the course of it all that a member of Parliament on the APNU AFC side had in fact been certified as positive COVID-19 and in fact had come to Parliament and in fact had participated in a number of protests up on the West Coast on the weekend as well as um, the activities on Monday by APNU in front of the, the courts with regards to the election petition and the Mingo's uh, uh, case. So that this was very disturbing for all the MPs, um, particularly our side. And um, this was brought to the attention of the speaker. And um, I, I think that it really reflects a level of irresponsibility um, to all of us as MPs, regardless of what political party we belong to, that uh, this is reckless behavior. And in fact, um, it is a criminal offense. It is an offense to do this under the Public Health Act. Um, to endanger willfully and knowingly persons with an infectious disease. So, Minister, so let me jump in here to ask the question then. So, let me jump in here to ask, as, as you alluded to it, um, under the COVID-19 guidelines, it's, 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 it's a criminal offence. Is any action likely to be taken at this point in time? Well, the public health people, I believe, the Ministry of Health people will have to be able to generate that um, as it comes under the Public Health Act. Um, but I think that from a moral point of view and an ethical point of view, the party uh, that has a member being so reckless and disrespectful of his own side of the House, as well as everybody else in the, in the Parliament, 
uh, the, the workers, the, uh, our side of the house, um, should be sanctioned, uh, even internally at the political level. And that certainly, you know, this parliament had, we have a hybrid parliament. In other words, uh, we can have a uh, virtual communication. And so any MP who is not well enough, COVID positive, can't get to parliament, uh, can all connect virtually. We have set that up. And so today there were two members of parliament that were uh, sworn in and voted virtually. And, and that is um, the region one representative of the APNU and uh, former minister, Mr. Patterson. Therefore, there was no need for that member to come to the house. The member could have used the virtual uh, arrangement to be able to stay safely in his house and to be able to be sworn in and to and to um, to vote, and that is why we've done the virtual communication in the parliament. This is the first time we're experimenting with that, and and it worked quite well today. And so it is something that we have to look to. As long as COVID is here, we have to be able to find means of communication that's safe. And therefore, this member. Um, has been highly irresponsible because it was an avenue for him to use. He could have used the, the connection with Parliament, access it through his laptop or his phone. And, and, and if the person in Mabaruma could do it, the MP in Mabaruma could do it, why couldn't the, the Mr. Jones, who is a living writer around the city, why would that be, be uh, so irresponsible? and as I said, reckless. And so the issue of an offense being committed, it is, and that I leave it to the lawyers and the public health personnel to, under the Public Health Act, sorry, to be able to um, take what action is required. It's a bad example. If you're a member of parliament, you're expected to carry yourself in a particular way. It doesn't matter which party you're in. And, and we're expected to behave in a certain way. And, and this is totally unacceptable totally unacceptable. Well, we trust uh, in the course of things that everyone in the parliament was safe today and there was no transmission of anything in that way. M Minister, you said it's an e <laughs> it was an eventful day in parliament today. There was also the walkout uh, just after all, all of the members of parliament would have taken their oaths of, their oaths of office um, by the APNU AFC coalition. Um, over what is being said that there was a break from tradition where the opposition would have gotten the deputy speaker. Care to explain how that works? Well, first of all, the walkout, no one knew why they were walking out in the first place. Um, the tradition, not in the standing orders, not in the constitution, is that the tradition has been that the government um, gets the, the speaker and the opposition gets the deputy speaker. And it has been like that for a long time. And in fact, the deputy speaker can come from any of the opposition parties. I have been in parliament long enough to see some of the smaller parties become the deputy speaker uh, years ago. The APNU AFC is the one that broke the tradition in 20, after the 2011 elections where there were discussions with President Ramatar and Mr. Granger, and we made it clear that we were supporting Mr. Ralph Ram Karan. They said they would think about it, they'd let us know. However, when we got to Parliament on January the 10th, 2012, we put forward Mr. Ram Karan's name, they voted against it, and they voted for Rafael Trotman. And then on the Deputy Speaker, they voted again for one of their own, Deborah Backer. So that it is the first time in the history of the parliament that the opposition parties got both the government, uh, both the speaker and the deputy speaker. So they broke the tradition in 2011, uh, post 2011 elections. In this case, 2020, we proposed Mansur Nadir as our nominee. They did not oppose it. They did not put up another name. And on the deputy speaker, we proposed Mr. Lennox Schumann. He is a member and a valid and a legitimate member of the opposition. There is no criteria, no requirement to give the largest party. There is no criteria reminding, saying that someone has to have X number of votes. And so Mr. Schumann was nominated. They nominated Mr. Raphael Trotman 
it was put to the vote and our motion won. And so Mr. Schumann will be the deputy speaker. They're not pleased with this, but there's no righteousness in and, and no criteria that says that APNU had to get it. As I said, we've seen it before in the parliament where a small party may have got the deputy speaker. So this is no breach of any tradition. The opposition is made up of the APNU AFC and the joinder parties. That's what makes up the opposition. And so the opposition legitimately made up of these parties are open for nomination to the House. And so no, no tradition has been has been uh, violated, as um, I believe Mrs. Kathy Hughes said, and he actually even got um, where she pointed out that a uh, small party is an abomination. I believe she said that a small party with 2,000 votes uh, get to be deputy speaker. I wish to remind Mrs. Kathy Hughes that in the local government elections of 2018, the AFC, which went on its own instead of being with the coalition, was defeated by 113,000 votes by the PPP, and in fact only won one seat in 80 local authorities. So I believe that Kathy Hughes is being very uh, mischievous and deceptive to try to make any small party look as if they have no right in the parliament to be the deputy speaker. And so they broke the tradition, but we have upheld the tradition in this parliament. That no tradition has been broken. The, the abomination that Mrs. Hughes talks about is the abomination that took place during the elections when they tried to steal the elections from the Guyanese people and punished us for five months to go through all the different means, including all the court cases, to finally get the results on the, on the afternoon of August the 1st. And so that is the abomination that took place in our country, not the fact that a small party and their representative has become the deputy speaker of the National Assembly. And I believe what better day for that to happen than the first day of Amerindian Heritage Month? Why is that an abomination to the APNU AFC on, on this day? And so I believe that the, the level of <coughs> um, dishonesty that's being portrayed by the APN UFC, I have listened over the weekend to statements by Mr. Harmon, where he has been deliberately misinforming his supporters in relation to the uh, detention of Mr. Mingo and others. He, he forgets to say that there were two, this matter was brought to the courts on two occasions, and the courts ruled that Mr. Mingo would stay over the weekend, etc., until Monday when he was freed on bail. Why would you be deliberately misinforming your supporters? We have the same thing in regards to, you know, the, the issues. Um, I've heard Mr. Harmon speaking about the election petition. The election petition is from what they're saying. I haven't read it, but it's a convoluted piece of work because on one hand, they're saying that the recount is full of irregularities, but they don't want this SOPs are not uh, important to be shown or nor to be part of the petition but at the same time they want the regional re sorry the returning officers um, results to be used for the elections and of course this is where the issue of Mr. Mingo's results and on the meet on the the spreadsheet that he used caused all the problems and going into the recount the APNU wants to have their cake and eat it and they can't because fundamentally they try to steal the elections from the Guyanese people. So nothing that Kathy Hughes or Harmon or others say that sounds self-righteous is going to bother my conscience because they still have not apologized to the Guyanese people to what they've done. And further and worse yet, they're calling the, the PBPC government an illegitimate government, which shows that they do not intend to respect the rule of law in Guyana. And so it is an eventful day but it also shows that APNU AFC has not learned any lessons. They have not learned any lessons in, over this period. And they will continue to, to uh, what do you call, weave a web of deception and hope that their supporters uh, will fall for it. And I don't believe their supporters will fall for it, not the majority of their supporters.
Minister, you spoke just over two weeks ago calling for parliamentary maturity. Can you describe, can you say that you've seen any of that display today? And what are you hoping for in the future? Because the question is, will the governing party reach out to the opposition party to see what plans can be used or, or, or decided upon for the benefit of all? Well, a lot of parliament business goes on at different levels. One in the parliamentary committees and where a lot of issues can be resolved uh, depending on which committee and stuff like that. So that the parliamentary committees is an important mechanism for intra-party uh, intra discussions um, and, and where a number of issues uh, could be resolved. Of course, the final resolution is on the floor of the House and I've been around as an MP long enough to be in committees and having reached um, agreements with the PNC, for example, and then when we get onto the House, and this happened in the constitutional motion, an amendment where got onto the floor and they changed their position so the constitutional motion could not go forward. So there's no guarantee that in a committee that um, the PNC, APNU, AFC will keep their word, in other words but that certainly in parliament there are issues that can be discussed to find resolution wherever possible however i do not think this parliament and the leadership of the apnu afc uh, is any mood to have discussions how can you have discussions with a government you believe is illegitimate when in 2015 we we accepted defeat, although we went with an election petition. We went through the transitions. They put us through the ringer with the transitions. They were very, very unpleasant and embarrassing to us as an outgoing government and members of the uh, ministers and so on. We haven't done that to them, but they have come with a, with a very aggressive, antagonistic behavior that says, they don't recognize the PPC as the government. So who are you going to talk to? Do you talk to someone that you don't recognize as any legitimacy? They, the APNU AFC is very confused. They're talking through two sides of their mouth and they're tripping over their tongues. You can't be saying you, you, you are hoping to have discussions and at the same time saying the people we want to have discussions with is, are, are not legitimate. They're, they're an illegal government. We're not going to recognize them. So, so how do you do that? How, how do discussions take place in that environment? I mean, I believe that Parliament, and I always believe that Parliament is a forum where we can, as different political parties, find common ground. But it depends on the parties involved. This government has reached out to civil society, to national stakeholders, to the other political parties that fought in the campaign and fought for free and fair elections and to have the recount and to be able to have a results that was legitimate and transparent and accountable. And we will continue to work in an inclusive way and a participatory way with broad forces of our country. If APNU AFC is willing to be part of that and to be progressive and to be responsive to the issues, certainly there's room for talk and space for talk. But if they continue with this behavior, then it's going to leave little room for discussions. And I mean, in Parliament today, having sworn in, the Speaker goes to speak and just walks out. They came in late into Parliament, which is always considered disrespectful when a, a large group or, or one side of the house walks in late. So you're telling us that you want to have talks, you want to say that you are going to comply with the rules, but from the first moment, you disobey all the rules. You come in late as a group, you look disorganized, you haven't found your seats, this the, uh, election is about to take place for the speaker. And when the speaker is elected, and after the MPs are sworn in, you suddenly get up and walk out. No one knows why you're walking out, whether it's against Mansoor, Nadir, whether it's against, you just want to go home, who knows? And so um, 
these are issues that the AP and UAFC and the membership of the PNC have to really come to terms with. Those are not issues we in the PPPC can solve. They're not the issues we can solve. The membership of the PNC has to be able to say to their leaders, stop the nonsense, stop the deception, and behave like a political party that is working in the interests of the Guyanese people instead of the interests of a few. And so we have to, we believe that this parliament has an enormous amount of work to do. We have a lot of work to do as a government. The first order on the item on the agenda, as shown by today, is starting to deal with the, the budget. And so the first step to do with the budget was done, completed, and now we move to the next step, which is having the uh, presentation of the budget and the budget debate continue, and then we go through the estimates. That can take up to two weeks or a little longer, depending on how many hours we can put in uh, with the House. We have legislative issues we have to deal with in terms of a number of laws that were passed that are unfriendly or even anti-human rights in terms of the Cybercrime Act, which included sedition, which was an issue that was removed by the PVP in 1997. The sedition law was removed from our statutes and it is the APNU AFC that put sedition back in. Most countries of the world no longer have sedition in their laws. It is felt to be undemocratic and it is draconian. The cybercrime, uh, sorry, the anti-terrorism bill has the death penalty 10 times in the, in the act. This is again another issue as well as other things. You have the SARA Act, the State's Asset Recovery Act, where the executive director can adopt and assume powers of the commissioner of police, the DPP, the chief immigration officer, et cetera, et cetera. This is madness. This, this is not law. This is not acceptable. And so I'm just giving you three examples of three bills. In addition to bills we have to bring, as you saw, we put a panel up for local content. This is an important issue that we have to resolve and bring the local content policy and legislation to the house as quickly as possible. We have, as I said, so we have an, a large legislative agenda and we have a lot of issues to do with, as we said before in the campaign, to do with electoral reform as well as constitutional reform. There you're talking about bringing a lot of legislation to the parliament. Are we going to see most of that coming before December or are we going to see the majority of those happening um, come 2021, early in 2021? Uh, I think that well, well, the two big ones, electoral reform and cost reform, will not come before, uh, mainly will not come before the end of December because there's a process. We have to have a consultative process to include the Guyanese people in discussions on the constitution. What do we want to reform in it? In addition to that, electoral reform has many different layers that have to be uh, examined, both in terms of from procedural as well as policy issues and will and may include constitutional amendments. And so those two issues will certainly not be, I believe, completed before the end of the year and that they will roll over. Both require uh, participation, consultation and involvement of the people of this country because constitutional reform in many cases may require in certain uh, aspects that one has to go to a referendum. So the, these are two major issues. The, uh, some of the other bills uh, will come before December, once we're over the budget, and there are a number of bills that will be able to come uh, forward. The parliamentary committees, um, we will, at the next sitting, elect the committee of selection, which is the committee headed by the speaker that um, selects the uh, MPs for every one of the other committees. And there's some urgent committees that need to be set up. For example, the Committee of Appointment in that the Judicial Service Commission has expired since September 2017 and our country is operating without a Judicial Service Commission as required by the Constitution. Um, there are other, um, the Public Service Commission has lost one of its um, 
members who died. And therefore, again, the committee of appointments handles a number of appointments going uh, to the president for a number of constitutional bodies. So that those kind of uh, major issues, of course, the Public Accounts Committee has to be set up because um, today we received copies of the Auditor General's report for the period ending December 18th, um, sorry, December 31st, 2018, and that the Public Accounts Committee will have to be set up where we'll start reviewing um, the Auditor General's reports, which are critical. And of course, uh, there are other agencies that come before the PAC. In that case, the PAC is always headed by, leader, uh, by the opposition. So when we were in opposition, we chaired it, and now it will be whosoever the government names as its chairman for the PAC. So that the PAC needs to get going, and there are a number of other committees that are urgent, the sectoral committees that review natural resources, economic services, social services, and foreign services. So there's a lot of work that can be done, not only in the sittings, but in the parliamentary committees. Interesting that you talk about all of that, and this is a, this is a lot because earlier earlier in the day I spoke with Vice President Barjag, and he said the, the the agenda is going to be an aggressive one going forward, which means Parliament is going to be meeting a lot more uh, in the future than possibly what we would have seen before because of uh, the, the the position we're in, because we're we're meeting during what is officially the recess of of Parliament. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're trying to catch up on time. I mean, this country has lost has lost time and it's very hard to catch up on time. Uh, and so we're trying to catch up on time to catch up on, put everything back in the normal, the, into normalcy and stability so that we can move forward. And that's why the stress on the budget and trying to get the budget, because in fact, there is a problem, a financial problem. There is a problem with the amount of money available and the state of the economy so that um, a number of the programs we're talking about which mr president ali uh referred to yesterday incentives um to do with the private sector assistance to people who have COVID, the 4.5 billion dollars to assist people as relief during COVID. these are major issues that require money and therefore the budget is critical to move forward so that we can assist our people and and to bring some relief to them when they've really had a, a double whammy as it is they've been dealing with the five months from march to to the end of july with with the elections uncertainty and 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 everything else and then also dealing in that same period with covid where we have found that um if had we been dealing with covid in a much more assertive and aggressive way um we may not be in the situation we are now in terms of the number of cases. And so uh, my colleague, Dr. Frank Anthony, has an enormous task. The prime minister who is heading the COVID task force has also an enormous task to be able um, to try to, to put the facilities in place, the, the drugs and the medical supplies, the equipment, and, the, and with the president, the social and relief assistance to the economy and to people and vulnerable populations so that we can try to turn back as quickly as possible the, the rate of infection that's going on in our country, particularly in interior areas, which were unfortunately neglected by the APNU AFC government when they were, de they were addressing COVID. And, and so they were, they were really left on their own for too, too long without support or adequate support um that could have helped them to reduce the level of transmission that we've seen in region in particularly in region seven and nine where we've seen and one for example maruka and so on so that we have we're still on two tracks lee we're still on two tracks but the tracks are slightly different we're still on the track of covid uh, 19 but we have in a track now of a government in transition that is putting things into place to be able by the end of the year that the government will be uh, capable with resources, human and financial, physical resources, to be able to, in 2021, rapidly move forward to address the concerns of the population, in particular 
uh, the issues of job creation, of uh, social conditions, on reducing the inequalities amongst our people, and particularly in inequalities between uh, in geographic areas between what's on the coast and what's in the interior. And so a number of our programs that we had before are being uh, brought back. Um, for example, the hinterland uh, household electrification programs and and um, the school feeding programs, including the uh, the the assistance, so that children will be able to even in COVID to be able to uh, eat a better meal or eat a meal, even though they're not at school. Um, and not able to access the school feeding program, which has been put on hold. So there are a number of issues um, that we have to deal with. And so whilst the opposition may be fretting at the side, um, we are driven by uh, an agenda, as Mr. Jagdeo, Vice President said, we're driven by an agenda to put this country back on its feet as quickly as possible and to, and to take care of all the people to take care of our people who've really had a rough time over the last five years. And it got worse this year. And so we, we, if we behave in, a, as he said, an aggressive way, yes, we're going to be aggressive with pushing our programs and policies. And we hope the opposition, particularly APNU AFC, will catch their level and recognize that this is for our people, for all the people of Ghana, not for their supporters only, but for all our people and join the bandwagon. If they don't, we still will continue to bring our programs through. And we will continue to work with civil society and the national stakeholders and people at community levels across this country to try to respond to their needs and to help these communities develop. We have no apologies to make for that, none. Minister, you speak a lot about what's going to happen in the budget. So, so let me let me use this as 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 I segue into into talking about that discussion. Budget is coming. I'm guessing, and this is from from my bit of experience around budgets. Um, the focus now is the COVID pandemic, the, the, the finding the money for the disbursement of the $4.9 billion to help assistance, uh, restarting the economy as well, as well as education, as you mentioned. So are we to expect um, a lot more allocations going to these sectors uh, when budget is presented in the new week? Well, you mean for the, this last period, October, December? This last period, going in. Yeah, well, we have, at Cabinet, we have approved uh, some uh, quite a number of ex, uh, funds for the, the Ministry of Health um, to acquire more equipment in terms of um, the testing so that they can do more tests because they only had one, one uh, what you call, uh, machine to do the PCR tests um, and to bring in medical supplies and uh, drugs because apparently they hadn't been purchasing for over a year any drugs for the health system. So these are important issues that have already been addressed in terms of finances being made available. And of course, there are going to be other issues coming out um, as we go along. We are going to a number of the programs that will be dealt with in the October, December will be more, uh, budget will be more along some of the issues that the president has referred to because it's not just COVID alone. We have to address the economy and we have to address the, the, um, the issues of, of our people in terms of their social conditions, in terms of their capacity to go back to work, to, to make a living again, for farmers to be able to function the markets, taxi drivers, minibus drivers, and so on. So there is a, a balance in terms of dealing with COVID, but also looking at how can we um, get back to some level of normalcy so that the economy can pick up and so the financial situation will improve. Those are the big challenges, I think, for the next few months. Of course, there are issues that are being discussed about school and when to open school and whether school should be open. And this is a challenge not only for Guyana, it's an issue that is being uh, presently debated in the United Kingdom, in different Caribbean countries and so on. Um, about how to deal with the issue of returning to normalcy in the schools and, and when to do it. And, and so these are major policy directions and judgments that we have to make. And so 
I think that the 20, the budget that we'll see will be able to uh, get a number of programs up and running, a number of capital programs up and running, but it is 2021 budget where the main issues that are going to be put up in terms of the transfer, transformative projects that we have talked about in the campaign and that are in our, um, in our manifesto. Those will be more in the 2021 budget. This year, this, as uh, Mr. Jagu has said, is one in which we are trying to deal with the COVID uh, uh, and bring it under control and also to try to um, bring the economy into some level of healthiness, which it, it isn't. And that's not blamed only on COVID. It isn't, cannot be blamed only on COVID but to terrible ineptitude, mismanagement and corruption by the APNU AFC government. And so those are issues that are going to be targeted and the main focus going forward between now and December. And those, of course, the manifestos is what actually becomes policy and the guiding force behind any government. Mm -hmm. Minister, a lot we've said <laughs> over the last few um let's talk about the as, as, as we as we wind down let's talk about the composition in parliament in terms of youth and the composition of the government sure. bench in terms of youth and experience and you're a wealth of experience possibly the, <laughs> the most experienced um mp in the parliament at this time and you're also um chief whip so let's talk about you as being chief whip first and then how do you use that to impact and set the tone um, for the younger the, 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 the younger MPs, um, not only on, 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 on your side of the house, but on, on, on the opposition side as well. I mean, there, there's a joke about me that people say that um, I come alive when it's Parliament, that I love Parliament, and they, um, <laughs> and so they, they tease me about... Um, there's one comrade of mine who teases me that... Um, I love Parliament so much that if I, when I'm dead, I probably come back to Parliament to see all of them. But, uh, <laughs> I, do, <laughs> I do enjoy Parliament. I do enjoy even the cut and thrust and the sparring and everything. I find it uh, stimulating, and I hope that the um, the young people uh, that they will get uh, smitten as I was. But um, the I am very excited about the young MP, the MPs on our side. It's a combination of uh, young people, of people from different geogra geographic regions and different classes, different professions, um, coming in a, in a really diverse group of young people who represent the ethnic diversity of Guyana. And I'm really proud as a member of parliament and as a People's Progressive Party civic member of parliament and leader that we've been able to bring this diversity to, to the parliament and how that has been done is based on the work we've done in the grassroots in terms of finding and going out and meeting young people and seeing that there's leadership uh, potential there. My task as a chief whip and as a, is to really, to try to ensure that our members of parliament are well-versed, that I'm there to guide them and help them and I hope, and I sincerely hope that, and I make it as a appointment, in that over the next two years, uh, we will find uh, young young MPs, and I mean young, not necessarily age, but also in terms of experience, who will be willing to take on the work of being chief parliament, of being able uh, to take on the responsibilities. A lot of work that goes on in the parliament is not when you see me just get up and rise on standing orders and procedures and so on. But a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes in preparing government, well, in this case, government business in the last one was preparing the opposition business. So my responsibilities as a minister is to work with the leader of the house, who is the prime minister, um, to, to manage government business and manage in an efficient and effective way so that the government agenda and program is not um, uh, harmed in any way in terms of not being functioning, not getting things through in in a timely manner, etc. And of course, to work with the parliament staff, in particular the speaker and the uh, the clerk, who have had a good relationship with both of them over the years, and certainly for the young MPs on the APNU side.
This is an opportunity to learn and to read and to study and to prepare yourself. And I hope that they will recognize that this is not a forum just to brook up and to behave foolish and puerile and walk out. As an MP, um, parliamentarians are very careful about the use of walkout. And the PNC used to use the walkout all the time, all the time. So much so that it became no one bothered with it anymore. They just ignored them that it didn't make a difference. We had the majority. And so we spoke to ourselves during the budget and everything else. And at the drop of a hat, they would walk out, drop of a hat, walk out. And that was in the period for, it happened in the 97 to 2001, 2000 to 2006. It took place at various times in the 2006 to 2011. So parliamentarians have to know that you don't abuse the walkout. And if you do walk out, you have good grounds for it. Today was an example of puerile behavior, of being little boys that don't even know what the game is. They just want to show that they, they got some kind of braggar. They can walk off the pitch. They didn't even bat a ball yet. And so it, 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 it was totally unimpressive. And, and I, the population finds it stupid. And so I hope that the young MPs on the APNU side will recognize that don't follow patter from some of their leaders, but get and study and prepare and research and do your work. Because obviously as MPs, we're there to represent the people. Some of us are geographic MPs, some are national top-up MPs, but we're all MPs there to represent the people of our country. And so it's a, it is not a light responsibility. It is a very heavy responsibility and it must be treated in a, re, a responsible way. It would be, for me, it would be infodig for me to get up in Parliament and to misrepresent an issue, misrepresent the desire of a community or a problem, because it's expected in public life there's integrity. And so, as I go back to the case of, you know, an MP knowing having COVID and coming into Parliament is so shocking to me. It is, it is so shocking to me that anyone would do that. And it indicates to me a level, a uh, question, serious question of the level of integrity that I'm dealing with as a member of parliament with the other side. And so I, I hope that um, all the MPs, the new MPs have come on. We have 13 new MPs. Uh, the other side has quite a few as well, I think, that we will be able to have activities in the house and in the in the to have workshops to uh, train MPs to expose the new ones to the standing orders and the rules so that they're better equipped and appreciative and that this is the highest lawmaking body of the country. This is not a bar. This is not a nightclub. This is not a, you know, a little group standing on, you know, under a bottom house. This is the highest lawmaking body of our nation and therefore it must be treated with that level of respect and seriousness because the people put us there the people elected us to be there we are the representative people bbp got 233000 plus votes the apnu got 217000 and therefore it needs to pull its socks up and to represent the people of this country as the People put them there, they put us there. The opposition, other opposition party, the joinder, I think uh, all the opposition parties, those who didn't get seats, um, but who got votes, was over 8,000 votes that went, approximately 8,000 votes went to the small parties. And therefore that cannot be also ignored, even though some of them are not represented, some of their parties are not represented there. And so I think that I hope that um, the APNU will stop their attempt to to be as usual as in 2012, 2015, they were obstructionists. They cut $90 billion from our budget. And at that time, they didn't even have a coalition. And so our AFC, as far as I'm concerned, is just the, you know, the, tagging the tiger or tie, they're hanging on to the tail of APNU for some level of legitimacy it's over, it's done for AFC. And so, um, unfortunately, they will continue to behave in this manner. And so 
I think that the this farm will have some rough times and it will have also successes. I am not daunted by or intimidated by whatever the APNU AFC thinks they can bring on, as Amna used to say, Amna Ali, the former uh, government chief whip. I'm not intimidated, nor are we on my side. None of our MPs are intimidated by, um, by the APNU AFC. We went through five months and our people are now stronger and, and mentally and physically, psychologically stronger to deal with the threats and the intimidation of AP and UFC. It is time now for the AP and UFC to recognize that they have to catch their level and they either uh, use parliament in a positive and constructive way, or if they're gonna go back to the 2012, 2015 period of being destructive and holding up budgets and cutting budgets and particularly budgets for Amerindian communities, then it's gonna be a rough ride, but that's okay. We can manage that. We're not going to be intimidated by APNU AFC whatsoever, whatsoever. Minister, on that point, I want to thank you very much. It was so enlightening having this chat. This was very entertaining as well. <laughs> I'll say I, I enjoy your sessions. I enjoy your sessions in the parliament. Quite, quite, quite simply, enjoy your, your, your sessions in the parliament. And as you said, I hope that you can inspire uh, the younger MPs with the, with the inexperienced ones and even the, the ones who are who, who've been there for some time, to understand the debate and bringing good level-headed questions and, and arguments to a debate going forward from here. So best wishes to you, Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, Gail, your best wishes to your government in its parliamentary agenda as well. I, we'd love to have this chat again some other time um, in the very near future. Well, thank you so much for having me and giving me so much time, and I wish you all the best. <laughs> We'll meet each other again. Follow the zone. Okay. Thank, Take care. Thank you good very much, Minister. Have a good one. Good night to your view. Bye-bye. Thank you. you too. This was NCN Extended. Thanks very much for chatting with us. We were chatting with Parliamentary Affairs and Governance Minister Gail Deshiro, telling us about the events and summarizing the events of the first sitting of the 12th Parliament, which opened earlier today at the Arta Chong Conference Center. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Have a good one.